everybody and welcome to this event. This is the third seminar that we have uh, from the 2024 ISTBS DES, which is the digital event series. Um, and uh, we're more than uh, we're happy to be here with Professor Skulk Elks, who's going to be the host for today. Um, just a little bit about Professor Skulk Elks. I'm sure everybody knows him. Um, he is a professor at the University of Plutoria. He's been a part of uh, the ice TVS community since a very long time. And more than that, he is the Deputy General Secretary of the Europe-Africa uh, region. So, Professor Skulk Elks, if you could take over uh, this event, I'll be more than happy. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to today's installment of the Digital Event Series. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker today, Maud Nitin Shenby, PhD. Maud recently completed his PhD, so we celebrate that with him as well today. Uh, Maud completed his bachelor's degree from Savit Dubai, Pune, Pune University in May 2018. He joined the Terra Mechanics Multibody and Vehicle Systems Laboratory at Virginia Tech in the fall of 2018 and completed his MS in the summer of 2020. His research interests include terra mechanics, tire testing, and vehicle dynamics. He started his doctoral research in the fall of 2020. His graduate research efforts led to the publication of six journal papers and seven conference publications. He has been a recipient of the ASME Virginia Tech Memorial Scholarship for academic year 2022 to 2023. He has also interned to Smithers and Sumitomo Rubber USA during his doctoral studies. Recently, Mawet uh, defended his PhD dissertation under the guidance of Professor Corina Sandu, who is our current ISTVS president, as well as Professor Kostin Antaria. Uh, so, Mawet, uh, I've heard you before at conferences. Uh, we are looking forward to your presentation on snow testing, so please go ahead and tell us what your work is about. Thank you, Varsha and Professor Els. Uh, I'll start. So the topic of my presentation today is compacted snow testing methodology and instrumentation, which has been my PhD dissertation. So before going into the details, my outline would be of the today's talk would be starting with an introduction, a review of some relevant literature, followed by identification of snow properties that affect tire traction, results of field tests, and some updates to classical equations pertaining to the Clegg hammer and its impact followed by a summary. So coming to section one on introduction. So what has been found in the tire industry as well as in research in academia is that it, it is difficult to improve the traction on snow and ice simultaneously. Though analytical models exist for tire traction on snowy road, it has been found that the, there exists an optimum void ratio like around 40% where you kind of get the best possible performance with respect to tire on ice and tire on snow. But both of them having good performance is like it's difficult to improve uh, performance on both of them simultaneously. Further, it has been found that the forces uh, existing at the contact patch when you compare fresh snow and aged snow they are better in aged snow primarily because the amount of energy that is being consumed for fp that's the like the energy that is lost for compaction is lesser also in snow the complexity arises from several factors one such factor is like when you have a 10% reduction in porous porosity. It has been found in lab tests that you found find an approximately 100% bearing strength in increase. Also, snow exhibits different kind of behavior in different like strain rate conditions. So to primarily go into the topic, two types of terrains are generally existing for our tires, which are which as we all know is undeformable, like asphalt, ice, etc., and deformable which is like snow or soil. What happens in the case of snow is uh, there is an increased reliance on the driver skill due to two reasons. One is you snow inherently being like grains of ice, you have a reduced friction at the tire snow interface. Further, due to pressure melting uh, or like frictional melting, water film formation occurs at the contact patch, effectively reducing 
whatever it was the available friction. The difficulty in modeling snow stems from three parameters. First is that the phase distribution of the snow changes in response to external factors. Now, these factors could be the application of pressure due to the vehicle moving on it. It could be metamorphosis. It could be temperature variations of the ambient and snow conditions. Further, the characteristics also depend on the temperature as well as the strain rate. And for these reasons, there are fewer indoor studies for characterization of snow, especially in the compacted stone domain. So coming to section two, as a part of my research, uh, I had done a comprehensive literature review focusing on all of the characteristics from a testing perspective, like what are the important material properties? What are the testing methodologies? But uh, my primary focus was purely on field testing methodologies, not lab testing methodologies and how these uh, testing results could be correlated to modeling. So amongst all, this is just a flowchart from the literature review paper that was published in the Journal of Terra Mechanics. But today we are going to focus on five specific aspects, two from a material testing, a material properties perspective and three from a testing perspective. So from a material property perspective, density is the most fundamental and important property as most of the mechanical properties are linked to the density. And it has been found that the hardness that you measure in field increases with the density. Further, the measurement of density in field conditions is generally done using some kind of cutters. Uh, basically, it's a sampler of a fixed volume that we know of and we just take a sample of snow, we weigh it, and we effectively find what was the density of the snow in the condition. So the most accurate way of measuring density would be a reconstruction on a 3D scale using the microchromatography technique. Now, what has been found is that the density cutters generally do not match up exactly to the microchromatography, te microchromatography technique because micro CT works on a uh, millimeter scale where uh, sorry micrometer scale whereas the cutters themselves they work on a centimeter scale but compared to the different types of cutters available a uh, cylindrical cutter is generally much more accurate in comparison for the elastic modulus of snow this is another important property and ideally the measurement should be done in lab conditions in literature it has been found that there exists a linear correlation between density and elastic modulus up to like 600 kg per meter cube further some literature has recommended that the measurement should be done by dynamic methods as static methods tend to underestimate the values because uh, like you're only looking at one region of the overall stress strain curve further uh, from it has been found in literature when you're using a snow micro penetrometer for certain ranges of density, there exists an exponential correlation between the Young's modulus and density. So go, coming forward to the two important devices, like at least from today's discussion perspective, I would go first into the Ramson penetrometer. So it's a typical cone penetrometer and is the oldest uh, one that has been used for snow characterizations so its general dimensions are that it has a 60 degree cone and a, a 40 mm base diameter of the cone it has been found that generally for the ramson penetrometer the hardness values in the initial 100 mm need to be adjusted by a factor and also that the weight of the hammer and the time drops between time between the sub successive drops affects the value of the hardness the problem is uh, ramson penetrometer has been found to be not very good when it comes to characterizing compacted snow. That is where uh, another device called the Russian snow penetrometer comes in. It varies from the Ramson in particular because its base diameter of the cone is around 11.5 mm and the cone angle itself is 30 degrees. There exists equations for the Ramson and the Russian snow penetrometer, penetrometer because their working principle is the same. To calculate the overall uh, force that is that the terrain is resisting the movement and uh, based on the number of drops required to achieve a certain sinkage. Now, error introduction in both of the, these devices could be due to operator variability, the device not being exactly vertical, wear of cone tip and several other reasons. The one of the drawback of the Ramson uh, is that generally because it cal it is used to cal measure the number of drops required to achieve a certain sinkage, you generally get the profile of the ram hardness as a histogram rather than a continuous uh, 
measurement based curve. The other two devices that would be important for today's discussion are the Clegg hammer and CTI penetrometer. So the Clegg hammer has been extensively used in soil and it was developed by Dr. Barden Clegg in 1976. The construction is basically the standard one consists of a 4.5 kg hammer, uh, which is like a sh shaft of steel. And it has an uh, inbuilt, uh, uh, sorry, embedded accelerometer, which is used to measure the deceleration that is offered by the terrain. And it was found in literature that the lower than standard hammer of 2.25 kg is ideal for snow property measurement. Its drawbacks are that basically, again, like the timing between successive drops affects it and the correlations are empirical in nature. The CTI snow compaction gauge is a device that is recommended in the ASTM standard to test according to the uh, test for the winter tire traction test. And it generally gives uh, measurement as a com index value between 50 and 100, 50 being the softest snow, 100 being hard ice. So its applicability to compacted snow is higher than fresh snow. However, you cannot use the values directly in any kind of modeling study. But there has been found that it is there is a exists a positive trend between CTI and light clay hammer. Another interesting study for testing methodologies was from traction testing perspective that was done uh, by Krell as a part of two or three studies between nine, uh, during the 90s. And the methodology that they follow is they actually have three different tests that they are con like conducting on a specific tire. They con conduct they evaluate the total motion resistance measured in snow. They evaluate the internal motion resistance measured in a like lab condition. It could be even a flat track and the external motion resistance. Uh, uh, sorry, and the gross traction when they um, like conduct a test in the field conditions, taking them all together. What the basic uh, hypothesis of the test is that the, when the Mohr Coulomb criterion is multiplied by the contact area, you get uh, the values in terms of like the gross traction being equal to contact area into cohesion plus the normal load into uh, tan of uh, the internal friction angle. So when they, these kinds of tests were done, it was found that generally the cohesion and internal friction angle evaluated using these tests, using these tests in comparison to uh, using these tests in comparison to what you can get from a Mohr Coulomb criterion. Generally, there was an order of magnitude higher and it could all the primary reason for it at, is that the contact pressures that you are dealing with in a tire condition is much more higher than what you're dealing with in using a classical shear vein or a bevometer kind of apparatus. Coming to section three. So why exactly are we looking at compacted snow? That would be answered right now. So basically what happens is the ASTM F1805 test is basically what we know as the test that is used to evaluate whether a tire can be used as a winter tire or not. And that is done using these tests on a compacted snow condition. So the testing methodology consists of like you have track uh, trucks similar to these, which basically you ch change the normal load based on what the tire load index and other stuff is. And then the vehicle is reaching a like constant velocity of 5 mph plus minus 5 after which the remaining tires are braked and the specific test tire in this condition would go in a controlled acceleration from 0 to 300 percent slip so it would go from 5 to 20 mph so generally the testing of commercial tires is against specific tires which are called control tires and most of these times most of the time these are the standard reference test tires the standard requires these tires to be less than two years old now as we were discussing the devices earlier most of those devices work they have their roots in soil testing they work well when it comes to fresh snow they do not work that well when it comes to compacted snow except for the ones that we were discussing in Generally, the testing is also conducted on at least three separate days, but there are some factors that cannot be quantified. Like basically the standard asks you to collect data related to the CTI gauge, the index number that we were discussing, the snow temperature, the ambient temperature. But there are some other factors that cannot be quantified. For example, effect of variation in sunlight could cause some kind of like softening of the top layers. The melt and refreeze cycle over a season could cause hardening of the lower layers in some cases. 
sometimes due to the drift effect you can have additional soft snow being deposited on top of a track so you have to make sure that you're like preparing the track accordingly and also that control tire is changed every season uh, and generally in the north americas it is like a new tire is distributed and correlated against other testers to have it uniformly wherever it is tested the CTI and temperature conditions, these are the only things that are mentioned to be tested against. So the CTI, the recommended procedure is you have one tire just moving on top of the snow and then you basically drop test uh, the CTI one, uh, CTI device. The recommended snow compaction should be in the range of 70 to 80 for it depends in what kind of conditions you're doing, but normal passenger car winter tires, they are tested in this range. The temperature also affects snow and tire properties, but it is mentioned that the ambient temperature should be maximum of three degrees Celsius, whereas the minimum and max surface temperatures are like minus 15 and minus four Celsius. Once all of this is done, it is also recommended to have a control tire being run in the condition to see how it is performing as long as it, it is within a specific range, it is okay to test uh, the commercial tires going ahead. So what we had found is in, in this study, we had data over five seasons and for the 14 inch standard reference test tire, which we tested according to the input conditions that we were discussing. And we found that the data itself is highly nonlinear and this could stem from uncertainties in measurements. It could also stem from the non-quantifiable factors I was talking about earlier. We created a weighted rank system to suggest models for future work and we found that generally the Gaussian process based systems are best for training models whether it was for the GM or SA traction coefficient. We also found that the CTI index is a prime contributor to the variation in traction coefficient followed by ambient and snow temperature. Now from a physics perspective we would expect that after the CTI index what would cause the most change in the traction coefficient would be actually be your snow temperature because the snow temperature affects the bonding between the grains and thus effectively how it reacts to loading conditions but that is not the case and it could be possibly due to two reasons the first primary reason being the change in snow temperature is generally lagged by the ambient like the ambient temperature changes happen faster than the snow temperature changes that could be one reason and hence uh, basically you do not find like the results that we found were different from what we expect from a physics perspective but this actually gave us a more clue of what we have to focus on because the cti index as i mentioned is basically giving you a combined measure of how the snow reacts to vertical compression as well as sidewise shear so it the cti index in our case in the all the five data sets so five years of testing we found it generally contributes at least 88 to 90 percent to the variation of traction coefficient and thus it gives us an idea of how important it is to focus on the compressive and shear tests rather than uh, also compre uh, also focusing on the temperature variations so coming to the further section uh, of like we had conducted a few field tests with the devices that i was mentioning earlier so I won't go into the, all the details of it today, but I'll go into primarily what we did. So this is a kind of representative image of how the test track looks like. We chose six locations in the latter part of the test track, which are like towards where the commercial testing generally does not occur. It historically has seen some variations with regards to the CTI. Also, there is a tree line next to the uh, test track, which causes variable wind and shade on some parts of the test track. So generally what happens is that the truck that you were seeing earlier, it comes here, you load it up with the normal loads, you change the specific test tires and it goes and then the in a single straight line, you conduct at least 10 different what is called as spins during the entire measurement procedure, procedure to evaluate what would be the overall traction coefficient for a specific tire. So for the... The six locations that I was talking, we tested all three of our devices, the CTI, the Clegg Impact Hammer, and an in-house device that we have developed. It is a part of the 
It is a part of a conference proceedings that were published in the ISTVs 2022 and 23 conferences. So what we found was that CTI index we measured three times at each location, about two hours apart. The mean value was like nearing the upper limit of the medium pack snow as it progress so basically we started our first measurement in maybe one hour after the grooming process has ended and as the timing from the grooming increased it basically in showed that the snow tends to harden up due to the uh, like ambient processes occurring on it also we found that the d e and f locations generally had a different value in comparison to the average coefficient of like how it was behaving in the locations a b and c so as we can it's not very clear in this specific graph but basically the d e and f tended to be on the higher region compared to the a b and c the average coefficient of variation was comparatively much low over a day of readings when it comes to the clegg impact hammer it the basically the device itself just gives you the peak value of deceleration and this can be used to calculate the clegg hammer modulus in some publications it's also mentioned that it's equivalent to the young's modulus the sinkage per drop and the ram resistance force in newtons so whatever we found results has been shown here and again your one interesting thing is for example when we see the resistive force we find that there is a huge variation between a to f different locations further one more thing that actually caused us to look into these specific equations that are used is that what we found is after five drops when we measured the kind of like basically the hole that was created we found that generally the overall sinkage tends to be in the regime of 25 to 30 mm whereas when the individual five drops the sinkage that was being con evaluated using the individual five drops when those were summed together the total sinkage came to be around 20 mm there was around a 5 to 10 mm discrepancy there that caused us to look into how these equations could be improved further which i'll cover in the further subsection the average coefficient of variation in this case was specifically in the case of resistance force was much higher than what could be considered as a good measurement for the in-house device that we developed, our in-house device is basically, I would call a modification of the Russian snow penetrometer, where the base diameter has been changed to 20 mm, the cone angle is still the same, and the drop height was, uh, sorry, the drop weight was changed to 1.5 kg. This was uh, basically an attempt to try to capitalize on the 2.25 kg Clegg hammer, which is actually found to be good uh, performing well in compacted snow conditions and yet the CTI the ASTM standard device is on of a much lighter around 220 grams so we wanted to like basically start a process in which we have a drop weight between these domains but further improvement in this condition would be like opt, uh, doing an optimization study of what specific drop weight would be more appropriate for testing in compacted snow conditions so even in this case what we had is our device we used to have five drops which gave us a five sinkage values at every two, two hour intervals at the six locations we found that the resistance force offered at locations d e and f to the penetration of the device was lower now this specific reason for this would be like the a b and c locations they have like so when we look at the pressure sinkage graph specifically what we found is that the locations a b and c they have a much lower resistance pressure initial initially which could be due to the softening of the top layers because of like presence of sunlight also the specific region of the test track that i'm as i mentioned earlier has found inconsistencies with cti measurement due to wind effects in the past so that could be a reason why the initial first or once one or two measurements for the locations a b and c they have offer lesser resistance force however as we go deeper due to like i'm postulating this that due to the effect of melt refreeze cycle over an entire season the lower layers of a b and c are comparatively harder 
in comparison to the locations D, E and F. The D and F, they are like, as I was showing in the map earlier, they are partially, basically they are, their entire duration, they are facing shadow due to the tree line that I mentioned next to the track. So one thing that we found is when we calculated the sinkage exponent and sinkage modulus values, we found that there is higher consistency in the sinkage modulus values, again in two groups because it depends on the overall pressure. The A, B and C was like in close alignment with each other in comparison to the locations D and F. And our values do not match literature right now, which was Dr. Wong's study in 92 for two reasons. One is the density that he was looking at is actually a lower density than what we were looking at. The We did a couple of density measurements in the track and we found that the density that we were dealing with was around uh, 500, was around 548 kg per meter cube. So yeah, we were looking at a higher density region. Also the cone dimensions in his study are different than the cone dimensions in our study. We were looking at a smaller cone for the reason that a smaller cone actually gives you a better way to penetrate, especially in the case of harder layers. So to summarize the findings of our study, we found that the CTI readings would not be useful for a snow surface modeling as like basically, as I mentioned, you get an index value, but you do not get the exact sinkage after a specific drop of the device. You have all the parameters according to the ASTM standard that you can try to basically create a drop test for the CTI, but you cannot actually try to optimize what sinkage you were getting because you do not know the actual sinkage from the CTI. The low weight of CTI could also be a limitation because in Dr. Shoup's study, she found that even the 0.5 kg click was unsuitable for compacted snow. And the physical properties using the click hammer matched the data found in the literature. But there were discrepancies, as I mentioned, for the total sinkage that we measured in field and what can be evaluated from the values in literature. So based on all of this, we decided to look into how we can Im improve upon the cl classical evaluation methods and what can specifically be done like basically open an avenue for further discussion uh, on this front. So need for improvement, we were looking at two specific devices, the Clegg Impact Hammer and our in-house developed device. So for the Clegg Impact Hammer, the overall, the all of the equations and derivation of the Clegg Impact Hammer is based on an assumption that the retardation curve against time is constant. So when your accelerometer, generally when it faces a like it would have a specific peak value after which it will die down. The overall equations are developed on the assumption that whatever peak value you are getting, that is what it faced for the entire time uh, during which like the impact occurred. So the click hammer has like benefits. It also has this drawback. So that is where we thought we can improve further upon. Ideally, you can also like have some kind of like wires getting like being taken out through a splitter or something and getting an exact uh, curve that is being measured by the accelerometer but the way that device has been developed the accelerometer is generally embedded into a housing which is screwed upon with the the shaft the falling shaft so getting wires out of it can obstruct how the drop actually occurs so that is a problem doing it for the in-house developed device as i mentioned it works on the ramson principle and in even in dr wong's work he has mentioned that for the evaluation of pressure the penetration resistance force is assumed to be acting on the projected or what we can consider the base area of the cone now this we were thinking could lead to like two drawbacks or shortcomings one is when we are call, calculating resistance pressure this way, a resistance uh, force this way, we assume that in if it was a flat indenter or if it was a conical indenter, it would have the same sinkage. We had done a small simulation study in our like in our sister project and we found that generally for a flat indenter, like if I were to convert the equivalent mass of this cone and just add it to the flat indenter, it would still get much lesser sink sinkage for the same drop force that is acting on it in comparison to the uh, having a conical end. So that is 
so basically your force being the same if your sinkage is higher it implies that your resistance pressure should be lower that was one point second point was that the resistance that is acting on this when in a conical case it acts on the surface of the cone and it when you're assuming it as a flat like basically you can have it converted as acting perpendicular on the cone and also acting parallel to the cone thus uh, basically engaging the compressive and shear uh, properties of the cone uh, sorry shear properties of the snow but when you're uh, assuming it to be a flat indenter it's like you're only engaging the compressive properties of the snow so based on these points we decided to look forward into the uh, like possible ways of how we can update these equations and look at the problem a different way. So we completed our work pertaining to the Clegg-Hammer equations and it was a part of the ISTVS uh, conference proceedings of the 2023 ISTVS conference. So the traditionally the sinkage evaluation formulation is based on the assumption that the penetration is higher than one mm. But when what's happening is every time a drop occurs, it's causing some sinkage and that sinkage ideally should add to what the effective drop height is for the next sinkage. Now the classical formulation gives sinkage as the drop height divided by 10 times the CIV, CIV being the peak deceleration value shown by the accelerometer. However, because the previous sinkage value should basically cause an addition to the overall drop height, we kind of updated that formulation to this one that is shown in the orange like box. Further, the elastic modulus evaluation that was done by Dr. Clegg is also based on this and it's uh, like it takes this equation into consideration and it also basically is based on like a rigid bearing elastic theory for a rigid bearing plate. So at one point he comes across like this equation before he substitutes. So he substitutes all the values of mass, gravity, everything. And then he goes on to substitute the value of H, which is the drop height. But as I was mentioning, uh, the drop height in itself is also like it is changing based on what was the sinkage in the pre uh, till the previous drop. So that specific equation also we have modified in this case. One more thing I'd like to mention is this and someone might ask that this basically, basically the constant in this case and this case is different. It's primarily different because the original equation that he develops before he change, puts in the value of height, it's based on the uh, sine wave assumption and he converts it to the square wave assumption. So that is actually causing the difference in the constant and it's not like an error or something. It's only that the denominator has to change in his equation. So when we did this and for the Clegg hammer, we found that initially the average difference is not much high when you're looking at the mean values of the Clegg hammer modulus and the mean of the root mean squared error at, of all drops. So it's not much high. It, the possible reasons for this could be like basically in our case, uh, because like the compacted snow that we are dealing with is like of too high of a hardness, you do not see that much of a sinkage occurring due to every drop. Also the RAM resistance, we did not try to improve the RAM resistance that is calculated using the Clegg hammer. And that is because the RAM resistance calculation is dependent on the correlation, empirical correlation between Clegg hammer and the California bearing ratio, after which that value is used to calculate the RAM resistance. So that thing has not been attempted by us. And we are currently working on updating, like trying to overcome the drawback of the projected area assumption that I was talking about earlier for the in-house device, which is based on the Ramson penetrometer. So coming to the end of my talk, uh, to conclude, we in this work we like tried to understand how compacted snow properties affect the tire performance and what would be important to measure and understand in order to like measure and understand for an FE modeling perspective. We completed a literature review to like identify drawbacks of the current devices, which have like their sources in the soil testing, but they do not work well when it comes to compacted snow. We analyzed a blinded SRTT data with focus on ASTM parameters to understand which specific testing conditions affect the traction coefficient to what extent. 
we've developed a device, uh, device as a fast test. So basically the overall perspective of our new device is like it should still be a fast test and it can be used like along with or in place of the CTI. But the ideal, the ideal way to do this would be an, a small scale bevometer, but that cannot be like if you want to develop a fast test using a bevometer generally it takes time, even if it was a small scale condition. And we tried to like basically identify some of the shortcomings of the devices, like the evaluation methodologies pertaining to the devices and also coming up with a different way of looking at it trying to improve upon the inherent assumptions. We conducted testing at the Smithers Winter Test Center on a track which is compliant for the F1805 for like evaluating the efficacy of all of these devices and also trying to understand how the new equations would be helpful in this case. So some possible avenues of future work in this case would be that the 14 inch SRT TT data that I dealt with uh, since 2020, the 14-inch SRDT has ceased production and the industry in itself has moved to the 16-inch SRDT. Thus, um, four or five years down the line, repeating this kind of analysis with the 16-inch SRDT data would be valuable to the tire industry. Variation of the cone parameters to evaluate like the size effect as well as the optimum dimension. So in our case, because we used only a single cone, even in the earlier slide that I showed, you would have seen K and N, not K, C, K, P, and N. And that is because we were neglecting the size effect. Development of a small scale bevometer equipment that could give you a better control on the loading conditions in comparison to what we were testing with. Also testing of like basically the device that we've developed and the click hammer if the testing is con conducted in a controlled and planned manner in an indoor research study. So if you are able to like replicate the exact kind of snow testing conditions in an indoor study and then you try to use the devices that could give us a better correlation of how well the device is performing in the ex in like in the infield conditions also you utilizing the proposed equation based on like actual sinkage values so even right now as i showed you with the click hammer we are not getting like a huge difference in comparison to what we get using classical methods and basically if we are able to like get the exact sinkage after every drop that could be a better way of dealing with this improved equation so yeah i would like to thank uh, obviously my advisors uh, dr corina sandro and dr costin ontario and the center for tire research for funding this study i'd also like to thank smithers winter test center and their team and crew for like giving me access to their resources and their test track to perform my experiments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mohit. It's uh, very interesting. We're sitting in South Africa at probably 35, 36 degrees Celsius, so <laughs> snow sounds uh, quite tempting to us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to encourage you to type your questions in the chat, or if you want to join the stage, please indicate uh, that to us, uh, we already have a few questions in the chat. Uh, the first one is from Lukas Kranowski, and he basically says, uh, on one of your slides, one of your slides, you mentioned a slip ratio of 300%. His question is, how do you, do you define this slip ratio as Lukas is expecting 100% slip ratio where the tire is slipping in the same place? So oh, yeah. Make... So, so in this case, if I have to, like, so basically that is how ASTM is defining it. So what happens is your effective center, like the velocity of the wheel center is still at five MPH. Your RE omega is causing the, like the, at the contact patch for it to move at around 20, uh, 20 MPH. And so you're theoretically calculating it to be around 300% slip. So ideally when your other tires are braked, but due to the single, like the force being conducted at the test tire, your vehicle still moves, propels forward. So that 300% slip is how ASTM de defines it. So it's basically when you're looking at the vehicle, sorry, not vehicle, wheel center velocity, it or what you can also consider the vehicle velocity, it's around 5 MPH, your acceleration, the controlled acceleration throttle that is 
occurring on the test tire it causes your re omega the contact patch velocity to increase to up to 3 and uh, like increase up to uh, 20 mph so they define it as 15 miles per hour differential velocity which is like in addition to what your vehicle is already moving at yes thank you so, little so little. and one more thing like i think he mentioned something the question mentioned something about like sinking so what is happening is like you see some kind of like erosion of the snow track but the snow track is much harder in comparison to what we see like just snow in the field for us to like actually sink in a single location like basically what happens is even during that entire like five or six seconds of which the tire is moving forward in that increased acceleration manner the vehicle still propels forward and you see an erosion of the snow track but it does not sink in in a single location because it is much too hard for it to sink in okay yes thank you for that uh, there's another question by George Mason. Uh, any thoughts on mapping spatial variability of soil strength and or traction? Uh, spatial variability as in, like maybe we can invite Dr. Mason. Yeah, so I, I think you mentioned that uh, the values differed on different parts of the test track due to uh, sunlight and things like that. So I think that is what he is alluding to. Oh, okay. So I think in the long term, that is something that can be done. But it's not like if I have to give a personal opinion, I don't think it is that easy. Because uh, effectively speaking, if like you try to do that over a two or three day period, and then you have a snowfall or say rain you have icification of the top layers and then it's like you're dealing with an entirely different track altogether so that is generally not the case if we are looking at other terrains but when it comes to snow like even when i was testing so during 2022 i was there testing for four five days after the third day there was snowfall mm. and literally like on the fourth day when i went to the track they had prepared the track according to their normal procedures and the cpi reading was consistent but the kind of readings that i'm getting with my device as well as the click hammer are completely different they are as if it's dealing with a softer terrain so what happens is with snow is as the duration from when the duration from when the snow has like come on the ground and has been untouched since the last time the natural metamorphosis itself also adds to its hardness and that is something that you cannot like basically if you're doing a spatial uh, mapping in like over a three or four day period and the ambient conditions change, you cannot uh, account for it completely unless you redo everything. I hope that answers. Yeah, so you need a very, very saying. fast and efficient way to do many tests. If, yep. uh, I think that's what you're saying is the tests are quite time intensive. So um, it's, yeah, it's difficult to do that. Did, did you see any variability, directional variability, uh, east, west, north, south? Mm -hmm and mapping that there's some craiging and geostatistics oh yeah so uh, i think i can show so one second and variability with depth oh so with depth uh, with our device generally we were going to a total depth of 40 45 mm beyond that it was as if like the force that is being applied is not enough to go in further and the overall uh, depth would be around three or four feet of the overall like snow track uh, in this specific location we were testing in this uh, six locations that i was mentioning earlier we had also conducted some tests in this region but those readings are not that like we don't have a lot of readings there but what we found is in this region we can find a good trend between the cti and the devices that we developed uh possibly because like as i was mentioning this area is like in for the cti at least it has been inconsistent because like from this to quote uh like my contacts in the specific test site this generally around like the end of the test track you see wind effects because the wind flows from this side so it kind of leads to softer snow in this region now i think this is I don't remember the 
northeast west south of this specific condition but towards the end it leads to a bit of a softer snow due to wind and like drift effects also mm, that affected you did that affect your test results then? uh so yes so when uh we were testing uh, like in our case i think like with the new device that was developed i still found like a better consistency in comparison to the cti device but yeah like looking at the sinkage modulus values as i was mentioning it felt as the abc were much closer to each other compared to the def and that is due to the ambient effects so it if you have to look at it that way this entire track could be like this region for a measurement perspective of devices you could treat it differently than this region when looking at it from a statistical viewpoint okay okay i guess i guess i got the second question too and then it goes to alex um i just was there curious about the way you might have looked at the different instruments you use you use the clay hammer use the cone penetrometer it looks like and, and yep. a couple other devices did you have one that you preferred over the others oh so basically uh like in our case what the reason we were doing with the clegg hammer is we were also trying to like compare against the work that was done by dr shu and with regards to our device and clegg hammer if i have to like basically we found a good trend or better correlation within both of those devices but the specific things that we are looking at in both the cases is completely different the clegg hammer we are primarily using it to estimate okay what would be the elastic modulus based on the correlation available and with our device we are trying to evaluate the pe uh, pressure sinkage relations because it's a uh, one way of cone penetrometer so we are looking at the pe pressure sinkage relations also for the depth i as i mentioned we are not going in much deep compared to the overall track of the snow but we think it is uh, up, like it is still okay because uh, the testing the winter testing that i was saying generally the rut that is caused due to that testing methodology ranges between say like the max value i ever saw was around 25 ml so we are going much below that so i think we are like still looking at the necessary depth that should be done at least from a fe modeling perspective for tire traction and as far as temperature is con uh, concerned we measured the temperature variability so at uh, the smithers they had like mercury thermometers and we measured the temperature variability throughout the track uh, it we generally found a variation of plus minus 1 fahrenheit throughout this entire track which is like around i think it was around 1.2 miles or something but yeah okay okay thank you okay alex would you like to ask your question please yeah hello mert and uh, yeah. spoke um partly linked i think to to the sort of questions that george has been uh, um talking through um, from a slightly different direction, possibly. Uh, one of the biggest ang anxieties of carrying out experimental work is always trying to get the, uh, the tracks and the test conditions uh, uh, right and trying to get re repeatability if you're doing repetitions and so on. So the, uh, I think you were also starting to cover some of the question uh, as well a little bit, Moet, when you were uh, replying to uh, to George, so the the first is three in one, and then and the follow up uh, possibly is how did you prepare the test tracks? Uh, it's not quite clear whether you've got a test track for one vehicle test or whether you can carry out several uh, vehicle tests in that area, um, overlapping but not using the same uh, the, the same tracks. Um, and did you have to wait for snowfall? I think in your previous answer, you mentioned the effect of snowfall was affecting uh, your results. Yep. And were there re did you have difficulties when trying to reproduce the uh, test conditions, which I think you've partly um, uh, covered, but maybe more generally for the audience, the difficulties of working with snow and ice? Oh, yeah. So uh, 
as far as the track preparation is consider uh, concerned like it was not me who was preparing the test track it was like a commercial testing facility by smithers winter test center and they have standard procedures as to how the test track is created and like maintained before the testing begins as far as multiple vehicle testing occurring is concerned the specific track that i was testing on is the track on which they conduct winter test like winter tire evaluation for passenger tires so it's one specific track that is only used by smitha so only one of their vehicle is being tested and generally that testing occurs in the first half of the like basically the first half of this test track so it was not like multiple vehicles are going in at the same time and causing like variations to each other's measurements yeah i think one of my colleagues at smithers had joined okay maybe he's not here like he could have answered that much better than i could okay um mohit i have a, a question for you in terms of contact area so when we drive over soft soil or we drive over sand one of the techniques is to reduce tire inflation pressure in an attempt to uh, increase your contact area is with a similar effect on your compacted uh, snow uh so it will affect but basically i was not doing the tire traction tests but if i have to answer it based on like the things i've seen and like observed when i was there so the testing that occurs generally like you based on a specific tires construction and the load and load index values uh you have standard testing conditions of how much the inflation pressure and the load on top of the vehicle should be for the testing to occur and these are set forth by ETRTO so regardless of where the testing is being done all over the world that will be consistent okay uh, let's see if anybody asks one more question in the meantime a last question from me you mentioned the beva meter a few times in your presentation so the beva meter has the advantage of isolating the shear and the normal uh, uh, pressure so uh, but it is a kind of a cumbersome uh, instrument i think that's one of the things you noted but uh, uh do you do you think uh beva meter will result in significantly better data uh, than the the penetrometer type instrument uh i think so like i don't know about better data but at least it would give you a better estimate uh, pertaining to like the treating the compression and shear domains separately mm -hmm. further because when like i think a small scale pavometer has also been developed i don't remember i think in sweden for snow testing but basically like when you have a motor there up there i think ray also in your lab has perf like created an indoor pavometer and i was in contact with him at one point of time but if you have a better control of what your penetration rate would be you can also maybe identify how the snow behaves under different strain rate conditions which has been like one of its prime considerations like right from the classical work by dr mellor in 1975 a, a lot of papers have done like discussed about this in the case of my device it's like more like a drop hammer test similar to the ram sound so i am not able to specifically identify the strain rate uh, dependencies so personally i i think uh, there is a good uh, challenge for the for the community for the better mechanics community to revisit the beva meter issue because yeah with, because sorry with the new technology we have in terms of mechatronics and actuators and lots of electric motors and cheap uh, affordable data acquisition systems and sensors uh, it should be much easier to build a cost effective uh, smaller type beva meter compared to the hydraulic uh, often hydraulic mm -hmm. systems used in the past but were very heavy and uh, and bulky of course we need to get the loading um uh, contact mm -hmm. uh, pressure uh, similar that is one of the beva meters uh, big uh, advantages but uh, i i think the community can really 
consider applying new measurement technology and actuation technology and see if we can't build a better vapor meter. Yeah, I think so too, because like one of the primary drawbacks of the current version of power meter is like it's too bulky. It has to be a vehicle attached version and it's too bulky. Yes. Okay, I think we are right on, on schedule for me to, to close uh, the session. Mo, I think we have one more question by Professor Alex Keen. Oh, in the, <laughs> yeah, or Alex, Professor Alex Keen, if you could just... Um, Read it out loud. Yeah, so I'll pop that yeah. in uh, after <laughs> so as, a, as a follow up. And uh, um, it's, it's, it's really some interesting stuff there, Moet. And I think one of our, our roles in, in ISTVS is to try and tr transfer um, uh, knowledge as much as we can across the, across the, the thermomechanics world. Um, and some of the things you've, you've obviously picked up on using some of the equipment. Have you documented and published the protocols, including the comparisons and the, um, and the new device that you've developed is the first question. Have you got some videos that we can actually put on the website so we can actually see them being used? And then lastly, have you actually come up with a name for your new device? Because obviously, uh, rather than just calling it in-house, it probably deserves something. And probably related to you, as it's uh, is it something you've 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 clearly had some a lot of input in developing. Uh, yeah, so I do have a couple of videos. As far as uh, publishing is concerned, right now I'm still in the stage of having those things mm -hmm. like put together for like submission. So once they're done, I think it would soon be like at least submitted to the journal for publication perspective. And I think your last question was, have you named? OK, no, I have not named. <laughs> right, some thought required, but uh, obviously it, need, it does need a name, I'm sure. OK, thank you very much. And some, some interesting stuff going on there. Thank you. OK, thanks very much, Marit. Uh, uh I think Varsha is going to show us some slides uh, just on, on more ISTVS stuff that we would like to make you uh, aware of. Uh, if you want to join ISTVS, if, if you find this work interesting, if this is the kind of community you want to join, uh, the information is there. Uh, we also have a conference coming up uh, in October in Yokohama in Japan. Uh, the call for papers is still open. There's a few days left. Uh, so if you still want to slip in an abstract uh, for the conference, please do so. Uh, we would like to welcome you in, in Japan. I hope to see many of you uh, there. Um, and also a reminder that this is part of a digital event series, uh, which has its own YouTube channel, ISTVS YouTube channel. So all the previous events of several years are available there. If you find this interesting, please go and watch some of the previous events and then uh, there's an upcoming event with uh, Professor Dan the Groot on the 24th of April uh, on Thermomechanics Models for Lunar Robotics Applications. So if you are interested in that, please remember to join us then and then the one after that will be Professor Chris Gooden. So there are uh, plans for the rest of the year. Uh, please remain on the mailing list and join us. And uh, comment, please. If you have anything to share with us, let us know. You have um, on the ISTVS website the contact details of the general secretary and all the regional secretaries. If there's some, somebody in your region whom you want to start talking to, please feel free to do so. I, I